One of my bigger projects recently was a video about Treyarch's Quantum of Solace game, and part of the response to that video was an overwhelming appreciation for its PlayStation 2 counterpart. I remember in my research seeing the occasional comment where people actually said the PS2 version was better, and I'm not sure I really believed them, but after releasing the video, it was one of the biggest sentiments in the comments. So I looked into it, and from afar it's visually very impressive. Obviously I'm emulating and upscaling it, but by PS2 game standards it's exceptional, emulated or not. And of course it's strictly a third person shooter as opposed to a first person shooter that switches to third person in cover. Uh, interestingly Quantum was also released on the Wii, but that's again a different version of the game, being a more direct port of Treyarch's HD version done by another Activision subsidiary named Beanox, and unlike either of those variations of Quantum, this PS2 PS2 game doesn't feature any multiplayer mode whatsoever. It's really, really unusual in a situation like this for the Wii and PS2 versions to be so different. This version was developed by Derby-based developer Eurocom, who actually worked on a lot of licensed games before this, including two really solid Bond games for EA, with The World Is Not Enough on N64, and probably my personal favourite Bond game with 007 Nightfire. And after this they did the GoldenEye remake in 2010, and 007 Legends in 2012, which sadly bombed. and the studio shut down. Now, knowing Eurocom developed this version of Quantum tipped me over the edge into actually playing it, and I'm really really glad that I did. Uh, let's jump in and let's see what's so fascinating about this version of the game, and if it is indeed better than the main version. Now this wasn't Bond's first third person shooter outing, uh, only a few years earlier in 2005 EA got Sean Connery back to do From Russia With Love, which was a sequel of sorts to Brosnan's Everything or Nothing from 2003. Um, something you gotta remember about third person shooters is that the genre was a bit all over the shop in those days, like, like Gears of War and Uncharted hadn't really normalised the third person shooter into the waist high cover shooter we all know, so they often all controlled pretty weirdly. Not to say that they were bad, in fact these two Redwood games in particular particular were actually really really fun, and I wish the genre would experiment now as much as it did back then, but there was just a lot more auto aim mechanics, a lot less cover mechanics, and a lot more clunkiness than there is now. The, the genre as a whole just wasn't as refined. But with Eurocom's Quantum of Solace they actually tried to create your modern third person shooter, which is particularly novel because this is on the PlayStation 2. It's taking what were mostly 7th gen design sensibilities and trying to recreate them on the 6th generation, and, and maybe I'm just like strange and I'm me and I, I enjoy seeing this sort of thing, but it is at least interesting to me. Like, it's pretty much a budget Uncharted with Daniel Craig on the PS2, and as such, this is a cover shooter that has a lot more of an emphasis on stealth than its 7th gen Treyarch counterpart. And by budget Uncharted, I mean like really budget Uncharted. All the basic mechanics are here, complete with blind firing, dodge rolling, and cover switching, but nothing feels smooth and the controls are just odd. Like, the cover system feels sticky, and aiming out of cover involves pushing the stick in the direction you want to aim rather than just pressing the over the shoulder button. Uh, it takes a while to get used to, and there's always times, usually when it gets like really hectic, that the clunky controls start to just be a bit too overwhelming. It can't be understated how awkward this game can really feel, like Bond seems to have this weird momentum to him that slows down for a few seconds after aiming, and a lot of minor things that are seamless in other games are really sluggish here. Uh, interestingly though, the single button hard coded cover switching is surprisingly competent. Um, if you do play this yourself, switch the button layout to the Royale preset for the most contemporary setup. I actually got in touch with some of the developers of this game and asked them a few questions, and they were super helpful and I want to thank them for that, but at their request they will remain anonymous. Uh, I asked them why they went with a third person shooter rather than first person, perhaps suggesting that it could have been based on Treyarch's early third person build of their game, but instead it was actually just because the team felt strongly that a Bond game had to be third person. It was important to them to be able to actually see such an iconic character on the screen during gameplay. And knowing that Treyarch's game has trouble with actually feeling like a Bond game, this was a great call. Uh, in terms of levels, weapons and gadgets, Eurocom's game is actually quite similar to Treyarch's, but this change in perspective alone goes a long way with giving it the flavour that it desperately needs. Now the levels basically like follow the same structure as the main game, they, they follow the same story and it's mostly set in the same locations, but the actual moment to moment design does diverge quite a bit, like, like the opening level at Mr. White's house still starts in the garden, goes down to the water, front, goes to the greenhouse, goes to the basement, and finally into the house itself, and 
Visually, they have a very, very similar aesthetic, but the actual paths and physical locations of things is swapped around quite a lot, with some new stealth or shootout areas thrown in or taken away. Uh, it's like both teams started with the same write-up and concept art and went from there. Like with Treyarch's game, this game had a similarly troubled development period for a lot of the same reasons. Uh, working under Activision's tight deadlines, the film's flimsy production, and the Bond license owner's aggressive restrictions was tough enough for both developers, but Eurocom had the added layer of working under Treyarch as well as they were following their lead. Treyarch's management style didn't gel fantastically with Eurocom, and I'm sure the fact that they were on different sides of the globe didn't help. Uh, Treyarch would try to keep Eurocom in the loop, but there were times where they would change something without updating Eurocom about it, which led to further frustrations. And though Eurocom had access to all of Treyarch's 7th gen assets, hardware limitations and differences in dev tools forced Eurocom to simply rebuild a lot of those assets up from scratch, and through this they didn't really have an incentive to make a one-to-one -one recreation of Treyarch's game because they were rebuilding it rather than porting it. So. Part of the reason why each level and the game as a whole diverges as much as it does is just because the game was essentially being remade from square one. Uh, this also contributed to a lot of the crunch the team experienced, with all the extra work of needing to rework so much. The bigger focus on stealth is another thing that makes this Quantum feel way more Bondian than the other Quantum, and again, the closest comparison is Uncharted. It's just a simple line of sight using cover stealth system with the same fused box cameras as the main game, and the same hacking minigame as the main game. Like, really it's just basically the same stealth system as the main game, control and perspective differences aside. It's just that here the levels have been way more designed around stealth, and it's way less punishing when you get caught. Uh, in the original game, if you were caught, that was that was like it. it. It was just alarms and shootouts until the end of the level. It was, it was it was actually really annoying. It kind of contributed to the reason why a lot of people forgot that stealth was even in the game because once an alarm went off, you'd just start shooting your way through the levels and 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 that was it. But but here, if you get caught, you can usually clear the room and the next room will be completely unaware of your presence. So you can easily go back to sneaking. It, it's a lot less realistic, but it's a Bond game and it's a lot more enjoyable. From a gameplay and thematic point of view, the handful of stealth bits in main Quantum were the best bits, so having them take up such a large chunk of this game is so much better. And where the clunky controls can get a bit much during the action, they're a lot easier to deal with when you're not being shot at. But there's a really big problem. The firing in accuracy is just ridiculous. It's one of those Kane and Lynch-esque shooters where the first shot from your gun doesn't necessarily go where you're aiming, like it, it doesn't go to the center of your crosshair, it just goes anywhere within the really large crosshair. So when you're trying to line up a sneaky headshot from cover, there's a decent chance that it just won't hit. It's not so inaccurate that it's completely game-breaking, but it is pointlessly frustrating, especially alongside all the control issues. There's more of an attempt here to have Bond physically interact with the environment. Uh, it highlights moments where you can shoot explosives, or shoot chandeliers, or shoot crane cargo down, and finally our super spy has the skill to open doors. Uh, all this like isn't much, but it, it, it's another attempt at making the game that bit less bland than Treyarch's, and it's appreciated. Now the game does diverge in some bigger ways too. Uh, notably the entire train level, which was one of the better levels in the main game, has been replaced by an in-engine cutscene of Eva Green's first interaction with Bond. Now, this was also an in-engine cutscene in the main game, but where the main game often has pre-rendered cutscenes, this game will have those same cutscenes in-engine, which is quite strange. Like, they'll have the same dialogue, the same audio, but it's just put together in-engine here, which seems inefficient. Like, why not just reuse those same pre-rendered cutscenes since the work has been done? Uh, my guess is, the game is about 4.4 gigabytes in size, which is on the larger side, and approaching a single layer DVD size of 4.7 gigabytes. Video files take up a lot of space, so maybe the cutscenes would have tipped them over into needing the more expensive dual layer DVDs, and they instead opted for in-engine cutscenes to save money. After all, it's a 2008 PS2 game. Uh, unfortunately, no one behind the game that I spoke to could comment on this. We have a girl downstairs. She says to tell you she's sorry, but this isn't her fight. The entire cargo ship level has been reworked. In the original game, you exit the car outside a warehouse, go in, see the ship, and help protect Vespa before shooting your way over the roof of the ship and getting knocked out by Le Chief. Uh, on the PS2, you simply exit the car on the ship, shoot your way through the ship, play the game's really out-of-place single attempt at a puzzle with this weird valve-turning thing, and then 
instead of just being punched out by Lashif and that's it, you get to see an entire cutscene with Bond being tortured and Lashif being killed, something that simply happens in a briefing screen in the main game. And it has completely new dialogue that wasn't in the main game anywhere, not even in that briefing screen. And after checking the credits and knowing that the game used the movie's cast, this is indeed original dialogue by none other than Mads Mikkelsen. Fascinating. I'll get the money. Tell them I'll get the money. Money isn't as valuable to us as knowing who to trust. The mission then keeps going with a bullet sponge boss battle with Lashif's bodyguard, and I feel like with this new dialogue, the PS2 version of the game is probably closer to what the main game was meant to be. Like, the, the recording sessions were done with Treyarch, so I have to think that these scenes were meant to be in the main game somewhere. It, it's as if this still has scenes left over that would cut from the main game. For example, the final boss actually has a sub-boss here named Elvis, and we're treated to one of the most PS2 cutscenes that I've ever seen. Mr. Bond, you've been trying hard to kill me, but here I am, still very much alive. I'm about to change that. Some things are beyond even your control. As you're about to learn, Elvis! I wonder why that was cut. The other new boss is in the Science Museum and it's absolutely the most challenging moment of the game. Like, I played this on hard because I guess I was feeling a little frisky when I started this and it was genuinely very, very hard, often in unfair ways. I definitely recommend playing on medium if you're planning to. And don't expect any progressive difficulty or like a difficulty curve, it's just consistently difficult from start to finish. Something else that was cut was the Vesper death scene and its corresponding level, which has now been relegated to a briefing screen. It's, it's, it's like they were trying to take all the emotion out of this scene in both games. Um, the biggest change in the game is an entirely new level based on the film scene at the docks, which pretty faithfully captures the look and feel of the movie set, at, at least on the outside, and it has you stealthily following Camille until an encounter with Green. Again, this has completely original dialogue from Mathieu Amalric and Olga Kurilenko, and it serves as a reasonably fun level which ramps up from stealth into shootouts quite nicely. It even includes a fun moment where Bond ziplines using his pistol, and it's just really nice to have another quantum level in my quantum game when most of it is just Casino Royale. All of these differences really just serve to highlight how much of a mess development was for both games and how little each team really knew about the film. In talking with both Eurocom and Treyarch devs, they stressed how they had to make educated guesses as to what the film was going to do because the film itself was a mess of a production due to the writer's strike. And knowing that, you can really tell that they were just patchworking these games together. Like, like all things considered, it's at least impressive what they did end up making. And of course, I guess the ultimate question behind all this is, is this a better game than Treyarch's? And, and to go even further, is this game worth your time? Well, it certainly has more character, and with a third person perspective, the emphasis on stealth and the more interactive environments, you have more of a feeling of physical presence while playing it, and it certainly feels way more Bond flavoured than Treyarch's game, which in comparison feels very, very gamey. I feel like I've hyped this game up a lot, like, I know it might sound like this is a straight up better version of the game because it certainly does a lot more things better, but you have to keep in mind that it's really hard to go past the awkward controls and the bad aiming. Uh, couple that with the lower production value and I didn't actually quite enjoy this as much as Treyarch's game. I was certainly more impressed by it and in a way I respect it a lot more for what it does and for what it tries to do, but you just can't go past that Bond meets Call of Duty gameplay, and that train mission is hard to beat. But if this controlled as smoothly, I'd prefer it like in a heartbeat. It, 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 even still, it's really, really close in comparison, which I think says a lot, and I'm glad I played it. I was fascinated from start to finish, and I wouldn't advise against playing this if you're curious or if you're a massive Bond nerd, because if you are, it might even do a better job at scratching that 007 itch. And with that, we wrap up the popular demanded video on the Quantum of Solace PS2 game. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I actually intended this to be like a way shorter video, so it's kind of funny. I'm looking at the runtime of my recording and it's like almost at 15 minutes. I expected this to be like seven minutes long. I guess I had a lot to say. It kind of got a bit overblown. I got in touch with the developers and I found the game to be more fascinating than I expected. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I justified the longer length of a video like this. I know it'll sort of end up being a depth video on the channel, but um, 
yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. I want to thank my patrons, including the ones coming up on the screen, and especially including my $5 patrons, Adam Beals, Analog Man, Boggy Online, Caden the Dingo, Chef, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Evil Chicken, Gary Pay, Labcat, Letherington, Lucas Racevic, Mattias Bayas, Maximilian Kunzman, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Mini Me Rubs Unsalted Butter on His Large Areolas, Mustache Duct Tape, Mrs. Mini Me, OK Got Food, Sunny, Peaceful Kumquat, Plague, Riddlin for Kids, Tia, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Mighty Mega Link, Thomas Damsgaard, Tommy Carver Chaplin, Traplor Ross, Trixie Emerson, Under 10 Hours, Riding on Games, and Zindictive. Thank you so much, as usual. I appreciate all of you, even if you're not a patron. I just appreciate you sticking around, supporting the channel. Haven't really mentioned it on video yet, but we did hit 100,000 subscribers, sort of recently, and that's just like super weird and cool. It's, it's weird to me that this is like a real thing, you know what I mean? It's like I still think of myself, it's such, it's such a generic, typical YouTuber thing to say, but I do genuinely still think of myself as just some, like, some guy just creating videos on the internet, and it, it's, it's cool that people are watching. I don't know how to express it in a not YouTuber generic way, but thank you, I guess. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for subscribing. All that stuff. And I'll see you, um, I'll see you next time. Take it easy.